Hello, this is Greg Smalley on Pod 366, a weird movies podcast. Joined today in an odd configuration, but as I often am, by my co-host in the lower corner, Giles Edwards. Hello. We are joined by the co-directors of Psycho Ape 2, The Wrath of Kong, to my... Uh, I would say that's left is Greg DeLiso. Hey, thanks for having me. And be directly below me, Addison Binnick. Yep, Binnick. Binnick! No, yeah. wow. oh, that's okay. Oh, that was less than a minute ago. <laughs> it's okay. All right, Binnick. <laughs> and uh, these gentlemen have consented to join us to discuss today's rather large slate of movies. Uh, released this week, which we will have to get through very quickly because there are so many of them. And then afterwards, we are going to talk to them about Psycho Ape 2, The Wrath of Kong. I think I have it correctly set up. And here we go. And here's our first. Hey! Giles traditionally will describe what we see. He's going to have to go fast. Uh, this time, because there are so many movies to get through. But what do you see, Giles? This is a vertically oriented movie poster. Dead center is a gentleman at about a 45 degree angle who's perhaps reconsidering his decision to lean forward over the edge of a very delightful looking glass and steel skyscraper building, which is uh, one among a number of the very tall things in this very large, this mega city, if you will, that we can see in the uh, lower right hand background. And the skyscape is a neat combination of uh, bright behind clouds before becoming increasingly murky gray as the uh, <clears throat> weather situation comes closer to the, uh, shall we say, surface of the image. All right. And you'll have to go fast, even faster than that. All right. This is Megalopolis. All right. It is Megalopolis. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so we are going to talk about this a lot more next week after I've seen it when it comes out. Um, obviously a movie that's gotten a lot of buzz. Um, Giles and I have talked about it before. Greg and Addison, do you have any anticipation for Megalopolis or any knowledge, foreknowledge of what it is or anything to say about it? I'll probably see it, but I don't know when. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really think it's going to be any good. But uh, I'll still see it because I'm interested in, you know, a enormous director self funding, you know, a personal mess. So that sounds interesting. Um. Yeah, I will see it as well. Um. Uh. It looks really cool. At least the visuals. I mean, I think even. Um, in any of his movies, sort of good or bad, there's always like crazy cool visual visuals, and um, the tr so the little teaser trailer things that we've seen have looked cool. Um, I'm curious about it. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of kind of funny controversy around it. I think they had to release some advertising with like fake uh quotes in the advertising or something. Yeah, and that's kind of funny. And so they had to pull that stuff and i just you know it's a, there's a, just a lot of lore around it so it's kind of hard to like not get a little bit interested um it, it feels like you know what is a days of heaven or something back in the day like just one of these large sort of uh indulgent but maybe beautiful kind of quasi masterpiece flop things so <laughs> there's just yeah. a lot of cool stuff around that and uh, you know yeah. i'm generally rooting for coppola so we'll, we'll see how it is but um yeah I, I like that description. That's what I'm hoping for is a masterpiece flop would be. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those are so rare. Uh, and they're and so good for us. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. move on quickly. Uh, All right. This, this is, is a one Giles can tell us about. Probably nobody else knows a thing about it other than Giles. So Giles, <laughs> take it away. With this the is a screen capture from a motion picture. It is a shot of a side view of an automobile. And in that mirror of the side view of the automobile is a face a generic 30 something odd face that is actually entirely latex and otherwise very uppity and dispassive and it is abruptio 
And what is abruptio, Giles? Since abruptio. Yes, what 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 is abruptio? Uh, abruptio is a uh, movie fe- uh, came out very recently. Features uh, sort of human sized puppet things. Plot is recovering alcoholic Les Hackles finds himself compelled to follow murderous instructions, or a bomb implanted in his neck will detonate. And it's not really about that, but no matter. So it's very puppet gory, right? Oh man. <laughs> and uh, there's like a conspiracy, I think. Conspiracy, aliens, uh, some of the creepiest baby things I think I've ever seen. So, yeah, there's uh, a lot being done there. And it is in very, very limited release. Uh, you can count the uh, number of theaters it's coming out on, in, uh, on both your hands and have fingers left over, but it'll probably, it will definitely show up on Blu-ray in, I believe, December, and uh, probably VOD as well. So, guests, have you heard of Abruptio, or do you have any thoughts, or does that little brief description get you excited about the idea of this puppet massacre film? I've never heard of it before. I have no idea what Abruptio was prior to just now. Um, I've never heard of it. It sounds cool. Is is um that wasn't true that there's not a ship in him that's gonna detonate like well the- that that is yeah uh that uh what a uh, the plot description which I uh, have on my review is accurate in as much as that uh, is why things happen but it's not what it's about. Gotcha. Okay. Well, it sounds cool. All right. We are really, I am personally really excited about that one. And we're hoping to have that director on as well to talk about that film. Third thing we're going to talk about is from Criterion Collection. We're into old uh, releases. Giles, describe the thing here. Uh, Banner style image, top two thirds is red tone, and then the bottom third itself is divided into three with yellow tone, then green tone, then blue tone. The top image is, I don't know, midsection of a face. We see nose, sunglasses, and the name of the director and the name of the uh, item in question. Bottom left, we see, I don't know, belly button to nose of a guy wearing an I Blame Society t-shirt looking down at something. In the green center section, we have possibly an athletically dressed individual, certainly long shorts and, uh, you know, Know, sneakers and a jersey style thing standing by a bench that has the helpful uh plea painted on it god help me and in the bottom right hand corner there is i don't know some guy good abs wearing slacks blue tone and behind him a lot large letters in a generic font uh, we can see the word dies and uh, all told looks rather you know moody and uh you know bleach blonde okay and it is from Criterion Collection, a triple feature, Greg Araki's Teen Apocalypse Trilogy, Totally Effed Up, The Doom Generation, and Nowhere. I've seen two out of the three and liked neither of them very much. And uh, The Doom Generation's kind of a nihilistic Bonnie and Clyde, Ruppel, uh, Black Comedy... Nowhere is a little more interesting. It's about L.A. teenagers, and there is an alien in it stalking them. Totally effed up. I've never seen. Um, I didn't think much of these movies, but if Criterion likes it, maybe maybe it's time for another, give them another chance. Uh, guests and Giles. I don't think Giles has seen any of them. So, guests, have you seen any of Greg Araki's Teen Apocalypse movies? Nope. Never. Uh, um, I have. Uh, first of all, Greg, the host. I mean, uh, got to give it up for another Greg at least. I mean, yeah. I know he's got the the double G at the end, which I yeah. I don't I don't I don't have that. I don't know if you have that. No, that's a fake Greg to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's there's just there's so few of us. You know, you got Gregory Peck. Uh, you know, I don't. There's just there's there's not that many famous Gregs. Yeah. Um. I love them. I'm I was sort of a kid of the 90s of this era, sort of indie, angsty, nihilistic Gen X whole thing. And it was really inspiring to me as a kid. I, I like Nowhere a lot. 
I believe he also did The Living End, which is not included here, but I that's a really stylized, uh, low-budget one that I just really love. Um, you know, I it reminds me of, like, Alex Cox, uh, maybe 10 years before him. Um, similar kind of vibe there. Um, and it's almost like uh, Alex Cox and Gus Van Zant like, combined mm-hmm. forces to make something like Nowhere. Um, mm-hmm. I think about the end of Nowhere all the time. Uh, I don't want to give it away or whatever, but it's just a, such a bizarre, <laughs> crazy thing. Um, and yeah, these movies, just even from the graphic design of the poster that we have up, it's just, you know, it's I eat that era up, that sort of late 80s going into the 90s, like um, just um, this sort of slacker and this generation of uh, indies. So I love this stuff. So this is right up my alley. Hey, and that's what makes the world go round. And I do think nowhere, nowhere stuck with me. Doom Generation did not. I don't think a rewatch would help that for me. But nowhere, I think I could uh, have a better reaction towards if I saw it again. Sure. Uh, but let's move on to so this one, Giles, describe the image quickly. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, so we got a jungle scene, and in the foreground, there's a young young fella, boy maybe, in his uh, early mid-teens in what looks like an academic uniform with a sweater vest with monogram and collared uh, polo shirt thing, holding a uh, pink item, I'm not really sure. Uh, the lad seems rather distressed. He's standing in front of a rather elaborate structure that's cylinder in shape, possibly with a sort of uh, onion dome uh, peaked roof on it, if it is a maybe domestic place. Uh, and a uh, neat little mm-hmm, medallion style and otherwise coiled circle imagery adornments uh, covering this uh, structure behind him, which I think is on fire. Smoking, at least. Smoking, certainly. Okay, and so now we're getting into the movies that probably no one knows anything about, uh, including me. This is called Omen from 2023. The plot is about an immigrant visiting his family. Uh, So he's a a Congolese immigrant, moved to Belgium, visits the Congo with his new uh, white fiance and is accused of being a sorcerer and uh, I don't know if anybody saw the trailer, but reviewers suggest that it might be a lot stranger than the simple horror movie it looks like. And uh, the Blu-ray includes three bonus shorts from the director, who I believe this is a debut feature of. And the only other comment I wanted to make about it is um, I am always hopeful when I see a movie from Africa, because Africa is like an untapped realm of cinema that they, there's so many good African movies that are waiting to be made and have yet to be made. It's hopefully it's the next, next frontier. So uh, even though this is from an African immigrant, it is shot in Africa and Africa themed. So that I find kind of exciting. Does anybody have any thoughts on this before we move on? I mean, it looks cool. I like the image. I I feel bad that I hadn't heard of it, but um, I, I just sort of agree with or will echo what you said about African cinema. Um, I was sort of curious is if this is more of that Nollywood, like no budget style, or if it's someone doing something in reference to that style but with like a bigger budget or if it's just more of a proper uh like straightforward film um because it looked the image looks like it could go kind of in either direction on that and i just uh it's i know it's been really interesting to see a lot of the different stuff that's been coming out of africa in the last like 20 years since the digital age Mm. i think that the trailer suggests this is a pretty well budgeted movie not uh, okay. Not not Nollywood style at all. Yeah. Doing its own thing was the impression I got with okay. structure and cash. Nice. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's move on. Giles, describe the image for our next release. All right. We've got a nondescript, possibly I don't know, burgundy style ground thing. Horizon. What's it? But the most important in- part of the image here is the large uh, owl-esque entity that dominates the frame. 
This owl's uh, head and beak look uh, bronze style, uh, statuesque, certainly, perhaps mechanical, has some interesting uh, aqua colored eyes of a uh, stony sheen and a blood or possibly slightly uh, flaming, but blood mostly tinged uh, grouping of feathers around the whatever the uh, the neck area of an owl is called. It looks kind of like a mane here, but I don't know the term for birds. Okay. The movie is called A Wounded Fawn. It was a Shudder original played on Shudder from 2000, the end of 2022 uh, until now, and now they're releasing a Blu-ray uh, with some special features and a bonus short film. The movie itself is starts out as a serial killer, it's kind of stalking his date. Uh, you know, they signed up, met online, have a date, but he's a schizophrenic serial killer. Third act turns uh, completely surreal because the Red Owl uh, and some other characters uh, represent the voices he hears in his head. They start to uh, completely dominate the action and everything goes totally wild uh, into a surreal horror film. Um, so I'm doubting anybody else has seen this, but do you guys have any comments on this one? I never heard of it. Yeah, me neither. But I don't know if it's a Shutter original. It's probably pretty good. I like the stuff that they put out. This looked up to their standards, at least. So yeah, that's what happens when you make it a Shutter original. Though people don't don't hear <laughs> end up not hearing about it so well i mean if you have shutter and a lot of their stuff gets uh theatrical distribution not all of it but um you know when people go see something like in a violent nature or mm. skin and marine stuff that did get theatrical distribution you know you see the shutter logo right up the, right in the front so you, you know if people remember that they can go home and sign up for that streaming service and see what yeah, else they they're, they're a lot better than some other streaming services in regards to uh, getting their media out there either uh, on a physical screen or on physical disc yeah i think more people i think shutter is doing very well for themselves yeah i'm a shutter i'm a fan of shutter especially since they usually send us screeners um go shutter they also i mean their their big thing right now is you know joe bob you know, yeah I mean, oh yeah yeah that, 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 that brings in a lot of attention. Yeah. I was a big Joe Bob fan from way back. I started reading Joe Bob's column in Dallas. I probably started reading it about a year or two after he'd started it. So I go way back with Joe Bob. Yeah, that's like the early 80s, isn't it? Yeah, uh, he started in 83 or 84. I started reading him in 86 when I moved to Dallas. So anyway. Not talking about Joe Bob. This is a movie that people might have seen, Giles. Uh, <gasps> All right, I believe this is father and son, and they're uh, they're in a an oppressively wallpapered room. Uh, there are two obvious sorts of uh, sources of illumination. There's a night table lamp, and it looks like something may be shining through the door elsewhere. But anyway, it's uh, mostly shadow. And uh, father looks like a clean cut professional and the kid is of a sort of awkward age. I'm going to guess he's 11 or 12 and he's just sort of started entering when uh, life becomes complicated. And uh, this this looks like the kind of conversation scenario where they might be having, you know, a heart to heart where, you know, father is trying to illuminate uh, certain mysteries that boy doesn't quite understand right now. Yeah. And, and I say uh, that mostly because I've seen this movie. Yes. And there were the, I think this discussion's a little little rougher than that because this is a still from happiness uh todd salon's happiness which is uh the blackest of black comedies imaginable or the most ironically titled movie imaginable mm. maybe um this is mentioned because it's getting the 4k uhd upgrade from the criterion collection this month so uh, we always ask, do, do either of you guys have a 4K UHD player even? No, I do. You yeah. do? 
great. I, I, I have, yeah, I collect uh, quite a few 4Ks. Usually the decision is, um, you know, if it's an older film that I'd like to see, you know, like Good and the Bad and the Ugly, you know, mm -hmm. or Dawn of the Dead, I, I want the 4Ks of those, you know. Newer releases, not so much, like I don't really care. But uh, if it's something that like is near and dear to my heart, then I'll get the 4K. Well, that's great. They are becoming more common because when we first started uh, asking about this, really nobody had a 4K UHD player. Well, they're, yeah, they're really expensive. So now we're starting to see them show up. Okay, well, that part's good. But what have, have you guys seen the movie Happiness and uh, did it make you happy if you did? I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. I hear it's a rather rough watch. Yep. Um, so I used to, well, it's weird to, even thinking this now, but I, I used to watch this movie a lot when I was in high school, like with friends and just, I had it on DVD at the time. You know, this, obviously Todd Salons fits right into that 90s, you know, welcome to the dollhouse sort of gritty uh, indie thing. And so he was just one of my guys as a kid. And this movie is, is like hard to talk about. I mean, you, you hit it on the head. It's the blackest of black comedies maybe ever made. You know, I think sometimes the, the, the crazy stuff that happens in it almost overshadows, I think, how expertly uh, well-crafted it is. It, it's, it really knows how to be a good drama comedy, you know, t t tabling the, the darkest elements of it. Um, you know, you it's the performances are great. The the cinematography is wonderful. The you know, the pacing, the editing, um, everything about it has such a good handle on its own tone. I really think it's a masterful work in that way. Uh, the fact that it, you know, it has some of the craziest stuff in it of all time. You know, I can you can either turn people off or it can elevate it because it's just such a shocking work of art. But uh, I love it. I got to see it at the New Beverly on the big screen with an audience because um, I was probably only 13 or something when it came out. Um, and I did that like a, about a year ago. And actually, the person that I was with was really offended by it and and uh, couldn't couldn't stand the audience experience. And I was interested in areas where it was getting laughs and in moments of tension and in moments of laughter. It was just a, it's it's a real experience. Um, and I, I love it. But I, you know, I. I hesitate to even talk about what it's. <laughs> yeah. I, one thing I always wonder about this movie, the, the gentleman in this still, uh, Dylan Baker, I believe, or Baker mm -hmm. or Barker, uh, Baker. he is, he is terrific mm -hmm. in this film. And yeah. he really never did anything after this. And be, I, I've always wondered if it's because his character is so. Uh, um, unlikable. <laughs> I would say partially. I mean, I would say that he ha had already been a, a pretty wor uh, often seen character actor. I mean, he's even in uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles briefly, uh, and that goes back to the '80s. I mean, he was um, so he's he's been in a lot of stuff, and he worked. Um, but I agree with you in the sense that it wasn't like a William H. Macy and Fargo kind of thing where it seemed like overnight there were a few guys, Billy Bob Thornton, that were like blowing up really big and you saw them in everything. That never did happen with Dylan Baker to that level. He kind of stayed in that character actor world uh, more than uh, his contemporaries like Philip Seymour Hoffman and Paul Giamatti and those guys. So I agree, but he did keep working, and he's got a long, um, he's got a really long IMDb. Uh, idea. Yeah, 151 screen credits and still going. So yeah. much he's, I believe, in the background. I believe his wife is uh, Becky Ann Baker, who was the mom on Freaks and Geeks. Mm. Huh. I, uh, I, I, I'm certainly not trying to run him down. What I was wondering, uh, you know, is specifically whether the nature of his character that he played here turned casting directors off well i agree it's possible yeah i definitely agree yeah and he might have ended up sabotaging his career despite having a great uh, performance but yeah. that's, all, that's all speculation on my part so no all right giles this this one 
All right, we have a brunette woman, and I'm going to guess her early 30s. She's looking in the mirror. We see her over her left shoulder. She's got a garish necklace with a gold link chain thing going on. And she, her makeup probably used to look really nice, but she seems distressed, and there are definitely uh, mascara tear streaks, and whatever lipstick may have been on her lips has been smudged around her face to the extent that it just looks like slight discoloration, and I have no idea what she's distressed about, considering the family she was born into. <laughs> so you do know what movie this is, Charles? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. There are probably... Well, yeah, I, I guess I'd be interested to see what other shots. The the trailer didn't really indicate what it was about, but this seems like uh, something that, you know, an actress going through a crisis kind mm -hmm. of motif. So, so it's Scarlet Diva. It's Asia Argento, uh, Dario Argento's daughter. I even recognize and, her. Yeah, and it's a sort of semi-autobiographical uh, look at an actress a sort of, you know, sort of B-movie actress trying to make it big in Hollywood. And uh, it's extremely trashy. And she asks herself to do a lot of nude scenes and crazy things. Now, she directs herself in this, so you can't say she's being exploited. Uh, but it's a very gonzo performance. And she is uh, naked and vulnerable a lot. And it's also famous because... It has one of the earliest references to uh, Harvey Weinstein. Mm. Uh, she has a character based on him and describes her real encounter with him in which she barely got away from being raped, apparently, uh, by mm. Weinstein. Uh, that so. explains. Right. Well, I'll disregard my uh, doubt about the uh, legitimacy here. Yeah, the whole project looked very intense from the trailer. Yeah, it's a wild gonzo type performance. Uh, I'm guessing no one has seen it or perhaps somebody has. No, I haven't, but it sounds very interesting and I, I really like her as an actress, you know. Um, I'm looking it up on IMDb right now because I'm actually very fascinated to find out more about it. I didn't know she was a filmmaker herself and Dario was one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, so. I think you should check it out. I think you, I, I found it quite enjoyable in a sort of guilty pleasure type way because it is, it reads like a trashy novel about a uh, actress and her sexual misadventures in the, in Hollywood. Yeah. I really like her in uh, like George Romero's land of the dead. You know, I like her when she just pops up in other people's stuff, not just necessarily confined to her father's work, you know? Mm -hmm. I yeah. haven't seen it, but I'm, I am interested too, yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, that one is one I do recommend people check out. Moving is that on, coming out on like DVD or Blu-ray? That Blu -ray is a re or it's on Blu-ray. Uh, it was on DVD before, and the only reason they just upgraded it to Blu-ray, there are no additional special features or anything like that, but it's a nice... Uh, the DVD was a nice presentation with a commentary from Asia and uh, some extra features. And so, yeah, it would be a recommended buy, I would say. Um, okay, Giles, you'll have to do this one pretty fast. All right, we got a mad jumble of uh, Technicolor, um, oh, we'll say Taoist uh, martial arts style things going on. Among the highlights here, are, I'm going to say there's a bowling ball looking weapon in the hand of one of the martial artists. But my favorite and most interesting thing in one of the two features here is a um, orb uh, character with uh, two eyes and a big grinning mouth and feet and hands. And uh, there are shots of it during uh, part of the trailer where we see it wandering around, possibly menacingly, but certainly looking very silly. All right, and this is a, a double feature uh, Blu-rays of called Two Taoist Tales or Taoist Tales, Taoism Drunkard and the Young Taoism Fighter. They are in a series. Uh, there was a first movie that is not included. Taoism Drunkard is kind of the more famous of the movie, and that has that little purple monster in it who is alternately called the banana monster or the watermelon monster. Um, 
And it is, I have not seen it, but by all accounts, it is a crazy comedy, uh, kung fu mashup. Uh, our Shane Wilson wrote it up on our site and liked it quite a bit, recommended it for the Apocrypha. Uh, the sequel is much less famous, uh, but apparently has them graduating from being drunkards to smoking crack, from what I could tell. Uh, and this is one I think our filmmakers might like because of the crazy comedy uh, stuff involved in it. But has anybody else seen, anybody seen any either of these? Nope. Nope. No, never. Fun, huh? Yeah, it looks fun. But never heard of it. Do you guys like kung fu movies in general? Mm, sort of. I mean, it's not like my bread and butter or anything, but I will watch them. I don't dislike them, but I'm almost almost completely illiterate in them, unfortunately. So, yeah, I mean, I've seen my fair share of like you know the most most famous Bruce Lee movies, you know, but uh, it's not a genre that I've really delved into. Same. And when they part start mixing comedy uh, into the element or into the uh, the mix. They become even stranger because obviously a lot of it doesn't translate the same way to a Western audience that it does to the local audiences and just comes off seeming really strange instead of uh, hitting the jokes, hitting the way they would for a local audience. So mm -hmm. we we enjoy them, but I, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, speaking of things nobody's seen... Mm. Giles, describe this one quickly, if you will. All right. Uh, there's some woods in the background, some planks. So we get a building and a uh, middle of nowhere combination here. A bunch of menacing looking heads, random titles splattered around, and a color scheme that hues mostly toward the uh, purple part, purple edge of cadmium. Uh, this is a collection of films, and that would explain a bit of the chaos on the box here. Right. Three, it's American Horror Project Volume 2. I never checked out Volume 1. These are curated by a guy named Stephen Thrower, who is a very British guy who's a very um, uh, powerful historian of American trashy, regional, <laughs> low-budget horror films. And he makes it kind of a goal to find some of the most obscure films made for the drive-in and bring them to light. <laughs> Three films featured here are called Dark August, Dream No Evil, and The Child. They're all said to be sort of uh, hallucinatory, dreamlike, in that you know low budget uh, '70s way. Um, one of them, Dream No Evil, caught my eye in particular because it's one of those movies about a woman losing her mind. Uh, which means lots of weird, cheap hallucinations. But I don't expect anybody has seen any of these. Um, in general, are you guys interested in super low budget horror obscurities from the 70s? Because if you are, this might be it. Yeah, that's me to a T. <laughs> I, uh, I, I collect my fair share of Blu-rays that have uh, Stephen Thrower commentaries or interviews and things like that so i know exactly who you're talking about <laughs> all right well this may be on your uh wish list then i'm a big fan of arrow video too they do a lot of good work mm, right <laughs> good people Just, you know their their blu-rays are a little pricey for me though but uh, every once in a while i might spoil myself and grab something you know okay greg any thoughts Oh, uh, I'm curious about it. It's not as much of my wheelhouse as it is uh, Addison's, but um, I I would watch it. I like it. I like the. I mean, I like watching that kind of stuff. Great. Okay. Yeah. One more with less than a minute. This is from Severin. I'm not even going to have Giles describe the cover. The cover is just a pregnant woman and a uh, German Shepherd and a child sleeping in a bed. And this movie, do not know much about. No, I think that's the pregnant movie. woman sleeping in the bed, if I remember the trailer correctly. Yeah. So some some foreshadowing within the cover. 
Yes, but this is basically a movie about a woman who falls in love with a German Shepherd Italian Euro art movie. And uh, that's that. We're not going to discuss more. It's a bestiality film. But let's pause <laughs> and come back uh, to discuss Psycho Ape, which is a little bit less of a bestiality film than this, The Creature. Um, <laughs> We'll be back in just a minute because we're running out of time right now. So I will pause. You guys will notice no difference. And we will resume talking about Psycho Ape 2. Hi, and we're back. And uh, no time has pa passed for you, but you might have noticed some of our guests have swapped positions. i chosen more... Uh, Comfortable seats, I guess. Um, our guests are Greg Deliso and Addison Binnick. Not Binnick, but Binnick. Um, at the beginning of last uh, episode, uh, the beginning of the show, I forgot to mention uh, we're hoping next week to talk almost exclusively about Megalopolis uh, with a guest. Uh, who has not 100% confirmed, but is, is fairly confirmed uh, to be there. So you can expect that next week. Also, there are not a lot of movies out next week other than Megalopolis, which will dominate our discussion. And the other thing is um, we had teased that Giles and I were going to be on the Movies from Hell podcast as guests. Um, and that recording uh, did not happen, was rescheduled. So that might be coming out the next week as well. And with that out of the way, now maybe we can finally talk about Psycho Ape 2, uh, a movie Giles reviewed for us. And so Giles may have most of the questions to ask, but I will <clears throat> start us out. Uh, guys, um, so I watched Psycho Ape 2 without having watched Psycho Ape 1, and I felt like, I didn't feel like I missed anything. I probably missed some in-jokes, but in general, Psycho Ape, the first movie, uh, what can you tell us about it? Is it mandatory viewing for Psycho Ape 2, recommended viewing? What can you tell us about Psycho Ape, the first? Madison, you want to take this? I would say <clears throat> what I've been discovering is that it's not mandatory, uh, but it's not a bad idea. Uh, but I have encountered cu a couple of people at screening so far who um, seem to enjoy the movie on its own merits who have not seen the first one. Because the second one is played at a horror convention in Pittsburgh, and there was a guy after the show who found me in the hallway, told me he had never been to a horror convention before, Never even saw the first movie, but he enjoyed the sequel on its own terms. Um, the movie just played at a drive-in this past weekend in uh, Indianapolis. And, I mean, it was a parking lot full of, like, 50 cars. And, I mean, everybody seemed to have a good time. I doubt all of those people even knew what Psycho Ape was, and they were being, you know, treated to the sequel. And a lot of people ended up buying copies of the first movie. So... I don't think it's mandatory. It's just more of the same kind of slapstick humor and stuff and crazy parody nonsense. But, um, you know, it, it's recommended. If you like the second one, you'll like the first one. There, there are two different kinds of movies, though, like tonally. Like the first movie is more of kind of a slasher movie or a parody of slasher movies. And it's kind of, you know, trauma-esque or Ed Wood. And the second one's kind of a crazy gonzo meta parody like Gremlins 2 or something, you know, making fun of the first movie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Giles. I agree with all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Giles, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, don't, don't undersell yourself. Some critics have gone so far as to compare you to Damon Packard, Stan Brackage, and uh, Jean-Luc Godard. So, you know, a, uh... you know I, was, I, I was really flattered by that comparison. And I, I've actually gotten to become pals with Damon in life. We're, we're both big uh, Los Angeles Kings fans, hockey hockey fans. And so we well, these last playoffs um, six months ago in April, we were watching um, the first round of the playoffs together. Um, and he's a really interesting guy. I'm really inspired by him. Um, 
you know, if anyone doesn't know, he made a groundbreaking underground film called Reflections of Evil in 2002. And he's made a bunch of other movies since then. A bunch of them are on um, Tubi. Uh, and he's just, he's, you know, he's a no budget inspiration. He's a true, like, mad genius, regular genius. I don't know how it's, you know, all, all around. Um, so I appreciate the comparison. I, I, I hope, I guess I'm, I'm feeling like, the comparison is because it's sort of these on the streets like things that are feel have a certain kind of spontaneity to them or something. I mean, I uh, cause I'm so flattered and I don't even know if I if I see it necessarily. Um, you know, it's funny about Godard, too, because I, I flattered by that, obviously, as well. I mean, Brackage as well, of course, all three. But I, I was really big into watching the French New Wave um, in my early 20s. And I watched through a lot of it. And um you know, Godard definitely has this sort of madcap, bizarro meta comedy in some of his, especially the, the you know, the, the main period from like 1960 to like throughout the 60s, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't know. I appreciate that, those comparisons a lot, but, but I don't I don't know. I just um, I don't know what else to say. I appreciate it. I have to say that. Uh... I, I see the uh, Packard and Goddard. I'm not sure where the brackage is coming from. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess um, um, specifically, I, I I can't think of uh, examples off the top of my head right now. But there was, I guess, uh, some of the mm, I'll, I'll call it kind of random footage sequences uh, sort of brought to mind because I. My primary exposure to Brackage was a movie, I think, was the title of uh, whatever that short he did fairly mm -hmm. early in his career, I think. That was just this collection of, you know, stock footage and random snippets of this, that and the other. So it was more of a, a vibe than perhaps a uh, motif. Well, yeah. there's something... Without I, ambiguity. I mean... <laughs> Uh, and I think Addison would agree with this, and we've talked about this. I, there is something just experimental about Psycho Ape 2, I guess. Um, it, it takes pretty deep forays into just, like, total non-sequitur nonsense, and it doesn't seem to have any regard for, like, any sort of traditional storytelling or plot or anything. Um, Addison, I think you've described it before, where it's almost like any time it comes up against a plot thing, it almost does this childish thing of like, really, do I have to do that? Like, I don't yeah. want to do that. And then it just sort of goes off into outer space even further as like a the rebellion. Movie, the movie is reluctant to tell a story. It doesn't really <laughs> want to. It, 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 it prefers to go outside and play. You know what I mean? Like, there's a whole 16 minute long sequence at the end where, uh, I mean, we have like a, a dream, a series of dream sequences that, you know, bear no, you know, there's nothing it has nothing to do with any sort of plot and then there's a qvc commercial that's you know selling its own merchandise there's then the characters venture off to the venice boardwalk and you know uh one of the characters gets an ear piercing and that eats up four and a half minutes of the movie but this is all none of this has anything to do with like the courtroom stuff or any sort of copycat killer that we were sort of trying to set up it has nothing to do with anything and uh, yes, it is a 16 minute long sequence that just sort of goes outside to play. It doesn't want to it doesn't want to get back to the courtroom stuff for a very long time. In yeah, in that sense, it reminds me of uh, Monty Python's Flying mm -hmm. Circus specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, we it's, it's sort of designed as like a series of sketches, almost like Kentucky Fried Movie or Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where you know we have a an overall you know story kind of but uh greg and i sort of describe these movies as like a clothesline where we have a setup but then everything that we sort of you know zip along is just an excuse to you know make gags and jokes and parodies of things you know it's 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 more of a psycho ape is a you know a uh, foundation it's an entity to then go inside and mess around okay and that, no. and that it does. Yeah, to uh, talk about the courtroom thing, I guess I'd say that that is the uh, actual movie. That's that's like the one <laughs> sort of broader narrative that, uh, as, as you so observe, you reluctantly return to. And then when you uh, want to move on from that, you feel completely free so to do. So uh, 
curious, I guess, for uh, structurally, how long, like if we just had the courtroom cut, would that be even like a quarter of the movie? Uh, I think it's like, it was like 10 pages of material and it's probably, yeah, it probably is like, I don't know, all told together, like 12 minutes or 15 minutes or something, something like that. I mean, it, so yeah, maybe like almost a quarter of the, of the runtime probably. Does that sound right, Addison? I mean, that sounds right. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Yeah, if you were to clip out all of the courtroom scenes and lay them out together, like in chronological order or something. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I have no idea. Because, yeah, Greg is the editor of both of these psychoic films. So he would know more about that than I. Um, And I think, I don't know, somewhere between like 12 and all, like, not, I don't want to say 20, but yeah, 15 minutes of it, probably. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. Because I'd say the yeah. longest is the beginning and the end. Like there's the right. introduction, which is probably a good like five minutes. And then the ending is like, I don't know, five to seven minutes. But then there's just like sprinklings of it kind of throughout the movie. But I guess, I, I, you know, if you extracted them all and laid them all out, 12 sounds reasonable, 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so that gives a, a decent idea of uh, the kind of uh, scattered approach that uh, you adopt for this. Now, there's a lot of uh, aggrandizing of the first Psycho Ape, and I guess I'll emphasize there's an exclamation mark in that title. Uh, obviously, you had your, your one your one foray there, which I haven't seen, the movie from 2020, which uh, certainly started this vein of um, uh, uh, good nonsense. Uh, what, um, upon completion of that and the reception for that, what were uh, some of the main things that moved you toward thinking that uh, a second installation was where you wanted to go? Um, Addison, well, I'm thinking, I mean, I guess, you know. It was gradual, you know? I mean, yeah. I go to a lot of horror conventions and I sell DVDs and Greg got the movie onto a streaming service called Night Flight Plus and it's on Amazon Prime, and we kind of realized, because we finished the first one in 2020, but that was like October of 2020 was when we released it. It was, it played once in a movie theater here in Michigan, but then all of the movie theaters shut back down. And, you know, I got all the DVDs to backers and stuff, and then, like, I, you know, the movie kind of just, just selling it sporadically at conventions for about two or three years, but it sold really well. That was the thing was that every time I'd go to a con, I'd sell like 20 to 30 copies. And then one day we crunched the numbers and it was like, wow, we've almost sold like 800 copies, a thousand copies. Like it's really up there. And, you know, if you go on like Letterboxd, there's about 248 reviews. And so it's like people have seen this movie, you know, more people than we could ever fathom. And that's kind of that became sort of the number one question I would get at conventions is are you going to do another one are you going to do another one even the lead actress kansas bowling when she would go do other indie movies people on those sets would come up to her and ask her specifically about psycho Ape. and uh, her and i just talked about this the other day because she was at the drive-in event that i attended you know she's been in like glenn danzig movies she worked with tarantino but the movie that was popping up on the sets of like murder size and other movies that she's worked on was psycho Ape. Mm -hmm. that was the popular one she had no idea that this movie was gaining a cult fan base because she just you know this was a movie she did it then she went on to do other things so it's kind of circled back around and once like news got out that like yeah we have like kind of a indie cult hit on our hands um that's when like greg and bill and kansas kind of you know came to me and they were trying to you know get another one going yeah i mean i've always been really kind of like astonished and humbled and proud and stuff that you know the first movie came out like addison said the end of 2020 at, you know during the pandemic and stuff and yes it is on night flight plus it is on amazon um but like we there's no trailer you know it's not on tubi it's uh you know it still is this like underground thing where you buy the dvd like through addison basically um you know there's not, it's not like in stores or really like, yeah we don't not, we never sold it know. to a distributor or anything like we never went to wild eye or 
any of these other, you know, like Werniger syndrome or Severin, uh, we still own it. It's still our movie and we never licensed it out. You can stream it on certain places, but if you want to buy a physical copy, it's like through me. But, uh, you know, because I go to so many conventions and things, uh, the movie's just gotten out there. Yeah. And I've just been, it's again, so humbled and like proud that it, in the few years since the first one, it, it, that it had enough legs in a fan base to where, um, you know, I think the first movie we Addison did a Kickstarter, we asked for about a thousand and, and raised like 7,000, which was the budget for the first one. And I think this time around, just we just made up a sort of pie in the sky number based on the fan base that we thought we had kind of built up over these few years. And we asked for um, 10,000 and we got to 14 by the time that we were in production. I think it's at like 17 now. And just to to circle back, just actually to your question, when you talk about the self-referentialness and the grandizing of the first movie, I think that for me, I'm a millennial, but growing up loving like Gen X comedy, like Mr. Show and stuff or Spaceballs, mm -hmm. where they're selling merchandise like for the movie in the movie somehow. Um, as a little kid, that stuff really blew my mind. And I was always just obsessed with that meta layer. And I think it was always a very Gen X thing to sort of like point out like corporations like selling the kids and trying to be cool and look at all, you know, look at these skateboard kids and we're going to market to them and here's a Pepsi and all that. So I think that went into at least my, you know, added probably Addison too, our comedy DNA. And so this, like the still that you have up of the, we call it the QVC scene where they're just selling stuff from the, from like the first movie. Yeah. Um, and all it of this, that, this yeah. merchandise is real too. Like these weren't <laughs> props that were made for the movie. Uh, Lunch Meat VHS, that's a real company. They made a line of like 50 tapes that you could have ordered, but they sold out. Trading cards, you can buy those from me, you know? And then we did another run of VHS tapes that we did independently. So like all of this stuff, and then behind Kansas laying on the chair as a t-shirt, these are all real legitimate things, you know? And they're all things that like we did, except for like that first run of tapes, everything else was kind of like other manufacturers, other companies coming to us because they wanted to create these things. And so into the movie they went, you know, like it's just very bizarre that other, we didn't have to seek out, you know, we didn't have to knock at any doors. Like, hey, can we get trading cards made? Or hey, can we make VHS tapes? Uh, these, these companies came to us because they liked the first movie that much. Nice. Well, we've spoken a little bit about the delightfully named actors Kansas Bowling. Uh, so if I might ask you uh, about uh, how you, you nabbed Bill Whedon for the first one. And obviously after the first one, judging from his performance in the second one, he was uh, among those people demanding that this happen. since uh, I don't know if I've ever seen an actor have uh, as much fun on screen as uh, Mr. Whedon does in Psycho 8 2. Uh, how'd you how'd you grab and what was it like working with that uh, trauma legend there? Well, I um prior to Psycho Ape, I did a show called Tramasterpiece Theater, which was like mystery science theater meets trauma. And uh, I'd done an episode on Lloyd Kaufman's movie, The Battle of Love's Return. And that episode played in a double feature with Sergeant Kabuki Man in New York. So the person who was putting on that show invited me out to New York and put me up in a hotel room with Bill. We were the guests of the evening. And we were in the pre-production stages of Psycho 8 2 mm -hmm. during this time. And uh, so Bill watched Tramastrophy's Theater. He thought the jokes were funny. And he asked me if I had anything else in the pipeline, if he could, you know, if I was coming back around New York anytime soon. On uh, planning on shooting Psycho Ape or anything there, I uh, hit him up and he would just be down for any kind of cameo. So when I got back home to Michigan, I told Greg about that. And Greg was the one who I think just said, like, well, let's offer him the role of Zoomus because we didn't have a Zoomus. And he was, it was barely a character. It was just like, well, he's going to be like a psychologist, a zookeeper, sort of just like a Dr. Loomis character, but maybe like a, maybe like a dog catcher or something, a guy with a big net. There wasn't really much to him. I think we had the safari suit for some reason. And we just yeah. did that. And he was just the, the, the zoo, Zoomis and zookeeper Loomis thing all fit together nicely for some, you know, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then he was, so I called up Bill because Bill had given me his number. And so then we were, we were like writing the script one afternoon for Psycho Ape. And it was just like, okay, let's just call Bill and see if he'll, if he'll do this. Cause once we sort of have him locked and we know that he's like down to do it, then we could just continue writing with him in mind. And that was a very easy phone call. He said, yes. And it just kind of, we went from there. Yeah. And he did have the most fun, I think of anyone ever. <laughs> uh, for for as for as delightful and as bizarre, but there's nothing wrong with that, as you can imagine. He had all the fun possible, I think, on that set. Yeah, but I mean, if you see the movie, you'll know what I'm what I'm what I mean. Yeah, you you see a lot of Bill in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Very very bold person. Very uh. uh no, no, no hold, no hold barred in the sequel. Yeah, yeah was, uh... and as the you know the the text in the movie says in various spots, like this was Bill's idea. Yeah. Uh, that's not a joke. <laughs> it might it might seem like a joke, but it's not a joke. <laughs> no, I, I believed it. Um, there, yeah, yeah, within you know, and having having uh, not seen the first one, but within uh, minutes of seeing this uh, Zoomis character, uh, every. Uh, on screen advisement about him rang very true to me. Um, so, yeah, all told, a, a delightful addition and, and great that, uh, that he was so on board with uh, what you were up to. And uh, also, I, I imagine very much making it what he wanted to get up to as well. Yeah. So, yeah. it's, uh, you know, there's an irreverence certainly throughout Psycho Ape 2, but uh, it's, it's mellowed by a very laid back attitude, which I appreciate, you know, in, in any movie that's uh, doing what you're doing, uh, this kind of uh, relaxed, hey, you know, we're just going to film and have fun kind of thing is, uh, you know, always, uh, well, especially considering some of the uh, more obscure and sometimes art house things that I stumble across, that is uh, always a relief for me to see genuine joy in making a movie as opposed to other experiences where it's like, wow, this is a slog for me. I shudder to think what, mm-hmm. what they're going through producing it. So, uh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, he, he is very good as uh, himself, as Dr. Zoom is there. Yeah, Bill is great. And I appreciate that a lot. I mean, I, you know, as Addison talked about me being the editor and stuff, I'm just, I mean, you know, we did have a lot of fun on set, but you also do have to like recreate that, you know, too. It's, it, I think part of what's fun about it to me is that if the breezier the end product looks, the more I feel like I did my job of like making it look that way. Cause it's not that it wasn't that way. It was, but you still have to kind of like, it can't just be, I'm closing my eyes and randomly <laughs> having clips. Like it's got to be done somehow. And so it's, it, when people comment on that, I just appreciate it a lot because it actually took a, it's a lot of hard work to get it to feel that way to other yeah. people. So, we, I mean, yeah. we obviously, we could just plant the camera down and film one shot, one take of them hanging out for 15 minutes, but that would be boring as hell. So, you know, if you notice in any scenes where they are like talking or hanging out, I mean, there's close ups, there's coverage. Um, so, you know, Greg being the cinematographer as well can capture all of these moments in real time and then edit them together to make it look natural, to make it look like you're right there with these characters hanging out and doing stuff. But in actuality, I mean, there is like time passed by and he did move the camera around, uh, but you're kind of tricked into thinking that it's all just happening in, you know, in that moment, in that hangout session. But like the, there's a scene where they're all sitting around playing with the trading cards and playing with the, you know, forming the puzzles and Bill can't keep up with Kansas and he's being really, he's become really frustrated. You know, that really was just us hanging out in Greg's backyard for like 12 minutes. And he cut that down to a four minute scene and it's just kind of like chaotic and funny and weird, but uh, that is just like us hanging out. You know, it's much more behind the scenes than a scene in a movie. And uh, some people like it. Some people don't, you know, I was going to ask about uh, like approximately what percentage of the movie is improvised because it's <laughs> like the scene you were describing just was it's felt improvised and oh, I yeah. suspected yeah, it was, that was improvised. improvised yeah. It, but, I always say with these things, you know, there's there's this, there's Psycho Life One, 
it's it's about half and half. I think mm-hmm. sometimes people would be surprised to know some of the things that actually were written and actually follow the written word almost exactly to what they were. Um, you know, the courtroom material was all written. Um, yeah, we could every not word go of- into. There was no way we could show up to set and not have an idea of what we were doing. It was far mm-hmm. too expensive to be mm-hmm. there and to not know what we were doing. Right. Um, and so I, I sort of take pride in the fact that people can't tell the difference, though, because it means that the writing has an ear to the sort of to the absurdity in the characters. But then also that that means that the actors are dialed in, too, because they can do both and you can't tell the, the difference. Like it should it basically all should feel improv like a bunch of kids playing or just made up on the spot. But, yeah, the, I would say at least 50 percent of each movie is just like actually written and then the other 50 percent is just like hey i'm turning like addison said turn the camera on and you guys just do some stuff and then we'll just play around so it's about half and half yeah and uh, yeah speaking of ear and scripted uh his name um eludes me right now and you actually make a joke about that i think immediately upon his introducing himself the fellow from uh Firesign theater oh gosh one of the uh newscasters i'm actually uh, as a troop, I'm familiar with them, but obviously, as I'm showing here, not necessarily familiar with the names behind the, uh, you know, collection. So, of sorry, the, his name is Philip Proctor. Yeah. And if you look him up, it's actually incredible. He was in like early Jack Nicholson movies that Jack directed. And, um, you know, he goes all the way back to the 70s, you know, the Firesign Theater, which is this thing that uh, unfortunately younger people don't really know but our our sort of older millennials gen x boomer generation either your parents had it or you had it they were comedy albums which to to this day and age is almost kind of they don't even know what i'm talking about but it would would be like a vinyl record but it would be a comedy and it wouldn't just be stand-up comedy it would be like a troupe doing sketches and stuff in like a radio format or an audio format and they were very big. They were very popular. I mean, to the point where if this was 1975, they might have been like a household thing. Um, he had ended up after that. Philip Proctor had a long career doing voice work for like Pixar. He was actually one of the supporting leads in um, Rugrats for the entire run of the show. He was Phil and Lil's dad. So not, you know, not one of the main babies, but like one of the main adults. Um, and, you know, so he's been in a million things. We, I think we he was not, in every like Pixar movie, like from the '90s and early 2000s. I think he was in like all three Toy Stories <laughs> and Ratatouille, and like A Bug's Life. You know, mm-hmm. he's he's just his voice work, you know, stretches like far and wide. He uh, and his origin, like how he got him in the movie, was actually he and Bill attended uh, college together. Like they were, they, they became friends, and they've been life friends ever since. I think they, yeah, I think they both went to Yale. Yes, that was right. Yes, they went to Yale together and they kept in contact. And so as a favor to uh, Phil, uh, Bill just asked him to be a part of the movie, you know? And so he came in, hadn't seen the first film, and we just sort of sat him and Dolores down, Dolores being Bill's wife, just sat them down in front of a black curtain and just had them rattle off news reporter stuff. (laughs) And Dolores was great too. They were both great. Uh, it was, it's, it's like, it was such an interesting honor to get to work with both of them and work with Phil because I had, had like never knew him by name, but I guess I knew of his stuff through my whole childhood. I mean, I watched Rugrats when, in the 90s when I was a kid and stuff. It was, so it was, just, it was very interesting. And yeah, I think that is an interesting thing that there's kind of in a weird way this comedy legend guy in the movie. In the kind of movie that really celebrates the kind of comedy that he was doing. But I, I think it's unfortunately somewhat lost on most audience people and stuff. And, and even kind of us. Because, again, I didn't know who. What, I didn't know. What, what fire what, sang here oh, was. Okay. I, I had no clue. The only like, you know, that wasn't us like seeking out, a, you know, a comedy legend. Like, oh, we have to get one of the guys from fire sign. He just happened to be an old friend of Bill's, you know. Yeah. I, I noticed, I did not realize, I thought you guys, I heard Fireshine Theater, I thought you guys were just throwing out a reference. I didn't realize mm, I was really one of the Fireshine mm. Theater troupe guys. Yeah. yeah. And I myself am not, I'm 
Firesign Theater is someone who I'm not familiar with myself, but it seems like every comedy group that uh, I like is always referencing Firesign Theater. Uh, oh, they're 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 amazing, yeah. amazing the groups. Church I don't, I don't of know the Genius. I don't know if the audience to. can see, but I actually found these at my parents. Oh, yep, yep. So this Mark is, Lennon, this, yep. if the camera can see me. So this is one of their albums. Uh, and I'm going to point out, so this is Phil of the bunch. Oh. Um, uh, that's there's It's these guys. Um, and yeah, I mean, their whole, you know, again, these are just like their whole record albums. I have one. I found this other one, too. So I have yep. two. But uh, that's yeah, my father's a big fan. So I, I got that from him. Very cool. Well, that's cool. I'm so glad that I, it's really cool. And I'm so glad. Yeah. That's, really that's kind of the first, this is the first time where someone's actually, no, someone's known what fire sign is. Cause like we, again, it was coincidence. It was just sort mm -hmm. of, we got this guy who was like a friend of Bill's as the news reporter. So it was okay, cool. We filled the role. And it's like, Oh, he has a rich history of comedy. We had no <laughs> idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that, that certainly is uh, great to hear, at least uh, for, for me and uh, anyone else out there familiar with Fire Sun. I imagine Penguin Pete uh, must, must be familiar with those good people, so he'll be interested in this. Uh, to scale it to a very different uh, sort of a production side, uh, we've spoken to a lot of people who've used um, like GoFundMe and other uh, styles where, you know, you get sort of a whole different bunch of random backers i wonder if you might be able to talk just briefly about uh what that's like and you know what kind of promises and what kind of uh shall we say because that will make it probably some limitations on you know what would otherwise be total uh creative ability um well for the first movie like like greg said uh we didn't really know how much money we could raise for a film like psychoid it was my first feature film and, uh, you know, prior to that, I had just done sort of riffing stuff like movies to watch on a rainy afternoon. I did that for like 10 years. It's like a 20 minute review show, just, you know, reviewing cheesy B movies. And then I did for Masterpiece Theater for Troma, but now feature length riffing movies. And so then when I went, when we went to go raise money for Psycho Ape, I only asked for a thousand bucks, just not really knowing like what we would raise if we would raise a thousand. And that thing took off. And we brought in $7,000 for us, the first Psycho 8 movie. Um, it was kind of, you know, a learning experience, getting everybody's, you know, uh, perks to them. Again, it was during COVID. So a lot of overseas stuff got seized and people like weren't getting their mm -hmm. stuff. And that was a big pain. But I learned, you know, how to raise money, you know, and fulfill backer rewards and make sure that everybody got their stuff and learned like what sells, like what kind of perks you can sell and which ones like people don't go for. So then by the time we got to Psycho Wave 2, you know, we doubled our budget. We went from 7,000 to 14,000. And this time around, we offered more perks than the first time around, like executive producer perks, associate producer perks, um, you know, submit some footage of yourself for like 250 bucks and we'll pl plug it into the movie. Uh, or, you know, for a little bit more money, you could actually come to the set, which some people did. And so some of the cameos in the movie are from people who either like drove up from Arizona to be in the film or were just local, you know, Los Angeles talent who wanted to be in the film. And so, you know, th that was something that we didn't do on the first movie, like submit footage or be a part of production. But so, you know, you offer perks like that and people go for them. It, it does, you know, you get money for that. And, you, can, you know, you, it's it's a good idea. And like posters and the trading cards and Blu-rays and tapes. So all of this stuff was offered as part of perks. And people, you know, they, they really went for like practically everything. T-shirts. That's how we were able to raise 14,000 bucks. I think I think the cool thing about crowdfunding is, is for in its simplest way to describe it is that fans of the project can basically pre-order a copy of something that they you know it's not done yet they don't have a guarantee that it's good but they can pre-order it if they're a fan of the existing thing and they can pre-order merch they can pre-order stuff they like and those pre-order sales just fund the movie itself and so one sort of tricky thing and for people that are starting out and doing this to try to account for is like 
you know, you have to make these product to sell. So you need to have enough money left over once you've budgeted for the film to be able to fulfill the orders that, you know, it, what if you kind of something that we are still somewhat learning, but we're doing a decent job is like you, you know, you shoot the movie with what you have and then you, you go off and fulfill the stuff. So, um, you know, we're, I think we're getting our orders out. Uh, I, I don't have any data on any of this, but I think we're doing it as well as any other production. And I think the other thing yeah, we, we pre-sold like 160 Blu-rays plus like 40 more DVDs. And so that's, that's 200 physical media copies of the movie that need to get to people. And I'm, I whittled that down to about 40 Blu-rays left to go. So it's been a, it's been a long process getting everybody their movies. But it's good. And I, I think so far people are are happy to get their stuff. I You know, the other thing that Edison mentioned about people buying cameos. So this has become kind of a trend in this little DIY backyard movie scene that we're all kind of in. And and it's a cool thing where people basically can help to finance the movie by chipping in a couple hundred bucks and they get to also be in the movie. And maybe that's their dream or something they want to do. I won't really give away the way that we did it in Psycho Web 2, but I think like anything else, we did it in our sort of goofball kind of class clowny kind of way. And I just, you know, look, I, we're really grateful to all the people that donated stuff. There were some really clever submissions, people that really made some really cool things, some really funny things. Um, you know, we're honored to have that stuff in the movie. and We hope that they get a kick out of it and kind of understand the way that we presented it as all like in good fun and stuff. Uh, but that's a that was a particularly kind of fun sequence to do and to also um you know we just the, we really appreciate these people that donate this stuff and we support that we, we're happy to have the support and so um yeah i don't know yeah yeah all right greg, you got a penultimate question greg yeah, no, i've got a couple of penultimate questions i wanted to make sure that we uh inform the audience how they can get a copy of rc psycho ape 2 do they have to go to your indiegogo page is they can. The, 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 Indiegogo, the Indiegogo is still active and you can pre-order from there. Or I have an eBay page that has like all the Psycho Ape stuff, one and two. Um, so you can get copies either way. One is on Night Flight Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them are on something called Rewindo. It's a really cool oh, yeah. app that um, is totally affordable. It's like seven or eight bucks a month. It's got a ton of really cool, rare, weird stuff on it, especially for like VHS collectors. Um, so both movies are on that one. The first one is on Amazon and Nightfly Plus. You can order a DVD or Blu-ray of basically each of them. I don't think the DVD for two is out yet, but you can order them through Addison's uh, eBay. All our merch is basically Googleable, and I think we have a link tree out there floating around somewhere. But yeah. there's trading cards, there's T-shirts, there's VHS tape, um, there's DVD, Blu-ray, um, and all that stuff is available. And you can, it's all pretty easily find with Google, and, or you can go through Addison's Facebook or just contact him. Yeah, I, I post about this stuff pretty regularly just because I am trying to keep it alive and active. And I, I go to a lot of conventions and I always bring my stuff with me. You know, it's it's like half the table is PsychoApe stuff and the other half is all of my work prior to PsychoApe. But, you know, I, it's, it's, I try to get everything out there as much as possible. PsychoApe 2 DVDs will be available eventually. It's just that the movie was shot in 4K, so we, we wanted to make the coolest mm -hmm. Blu-ray possible. You know, again, I've seen the movie projected at Drive-In. It looks amazing. I went to a movie theater in Michigan. They projected the Blu-ray right on, on a big screen. It looks immaculate. It's it's amazing. You know, this, this scrappy little goofy movie, you know, shot in 4K, you know, projected on a giant screen, though. It's like this movie shouldn't look this good, but it does. All right. We're probably not going to have time for our final question, but I do have, I am going to let you, if you can, in the last 45 seconds... Do you have anything coming up that you need to pitch? Anything new that you'd like to? Um, I have a movie that I shot a year prior to Psycho uh, 2 called Bad Brain that Kansas Bowling, Bill Weedon are both actually in as well. But kind of a bunch of other cool people. And I'll be doing a finishing funds campaign for Bad Brain coming up uh, pretty soon in the next couple of months. Okay. Addison? I'm just promoting Psycho Web 2 right now, going to as many conventions and screenings as possible. Okay, great. Well, we are about out of time. So thank you very much, Greg DeLiso and Anderson Binnick. Thanks for having us. And thank you for the great review. Yeah, thank you. Track down Psycho Ape 2. And we'll see you next week, guys. Stay weird. Bye-bye. All right.
Did it go off? Is it? Weird. Yeah, I guess that is the word for it. Weird. 